keeping with the theme of the uh, speakers for this afternoon, we have a double feature. We're very pleased to have two speakers, two featured speakers for this afternoon. Uh, two great speakers uh, that have uh, some topics that I'm sure you will all enjoy. Um, to uh, bring up our first speaker, we have a great uh, leader of the National Space Society uh, from San Antonio who chaired one of these conferences a few years ago. Uh, so I'd like to ask Dr. Carol Redfield to come forward to introduce our first speaker. Yeah, it was 15 years ago, 14 years ago. San Antonio conference. Uh, so Jim Voss graduated from Auburn University with a degree in aerospace engineering in 1972. Yes, they had aerospace engineering in 1972. And received his master's degree from University of Colorado in 1974. And in 2000, he received an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Colorado. He's a retired army colonel and he served as an infantryman in Germany, taught at West Point, attended the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, and then worked as a flight test engineer at Edwards Air Force Base. After being assigned to Johnson Space Center as a vehicle and integration test engineer in 1984, he was selected for the astronaut program in 1987. I mentioned to him when I was telling him I put some notes around here he did a lot of schooling, right? <laughs> he agreed. Uh, during his tenure at NASA, Jim has worked on shuttle safety, software checkout, as a spacecraft communicator, and as the astronaut office training representative. He's done extensive extravehicular activity development work for current and future missions. He served as a backup crew member for two missions to the Russian space station Mir. During this time, he lived and trained for two years at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia. Jim's last role with NASA was as a deputy for flight operations in the Space Station Program Mission Integration and Operations Office. Jim has received numerous awards and recognition throughout his career, including the highest honors presented by NASA and by the U.S. Army during peacetime. Now here's the stuff that we all want to do. And Jim has flown on five space missions and conducted four space walks, which included the longest, eight hours and 56 minutes, and the shortest, 19 minutes, <laughs> the first space walk from the space station, and one in a Russian space suit. Oh. In <laughs> you may have to talk about that one. In in 2001, Jim was a member of the Expedition 2 crew on board the International Space Station for 163 days, bringing his total time living and working off the Earth to 202 days. Jim retired from NASA in 2003 to become Associate Dean of Engineering for External Affairs at Auburn University, went back to where he started. Right? assisting with student projects and development for the college while teaching a class in aerospace engineering on human spacecraft design. Jim is now Vice President for Space Exploration Systems at Transformational Space Corporation where he will be responsible for designing and construction of the human spacecraft that they'll be doing. He also speaks to audiences around the United States about his space experiences. Please welcome Jim Boss. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, yeah there was a lot of schooling, and that, that Orlon experience was not that good. I, I don't know where that squeal came from, but <laughs> it, was, it was a good experience, but not quite like that. Well, you know, George asked me to speak to you today, uh, and I said, well, George, what would you like for me to talk about? And I was thinking, like usual, someone would want me to talk about my space experiences, uh, living and working on the International Space Station, maybe something about a shuttle flight or doing spacewalks, all that really exciting 
space stuff. And George surprised me. We were doing this by email at first. He surprised me by saying, well, we'd like you to talk about the IMAX movie making. And I thought, well, OK. <laughs> I guess I can do that. Uh, so I, I scratched my head a little bit and I said, well, at least I did that movie making in space, so maybe I can fool him and I can talk a little bit about making the IMAX movie and talk a lot more about living and working in space. And so I'm going to tell you about the IMAX movie and the making of that movie, the part of it that we did in space, and a little bit of my role in that movie making. Here's some, you can follow along up here. There have been some uh, movie producers who have done some nice work with space topics. But <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't expect to be in that group. But I did more than just produce. <laughs> You know, I don't even know what a grip or a best boy do, but, but I'm sure that I did it uh, with this movie. When Tony Myers is a wonderful person, she's the real producer of the IMAX 3D space station movie, and I hope all of you have had the chance to see it. I actually spoke to someone who hadn't seen it, and I was surprised and disappointed, but I hope that you have seen it. Uh, Tony is, was the real producer, and she came to me in about 1999, or maybe it was 2000. It was well before our space station flight, and uh, she came to us as a group and said, we need you to train on the IMAX uh, hardware so that we can shoot some really exciting things that are happening during your expedition. It was the second expedition to the space station, so there was a lot of assembly going on, some good things to film, uh, a lot of crews coming up with shuttles so they could haul the film up and back again. So it was a perfect time to shoot the IMAX movie. Well, she asked us to do it, and they said, and it'll only take about 200 hours of training. Well, we were a thousand hours oversubscribed for our training at that point. That is a thousand hours of training we were not going to be able to do that the space program thought was important for our survival and well-being when we lived in space. So I said immediately as our training representative for the crew, I'm sorry, we just can't do that, Tony. We don't have the time to train for it. There are things like uh, abort uh, simulations. Uh, there's learning how to use our electrical system on the space station. Things like that that we might not be able to get all our training on because we don't have enough time. So she said, okay, I'm very sorry, and she went away, and then she came back. And she said, Jim, we'd really like you to train on the IMAX hardware so that you can shoot some film during your part of the expedition. And I said, Tony, we just don't have time to do it. I'm sorry, we still are way oversubscribed. So she went away, and then she came back. And <laughs> I couldn't get rid of her, she wouldn't give up. And so finally, I, I, I said, well, Tony, I love filming in space. I like taking pictures, I like doing movies. I really do enjoy that, so I'll make a deal with you. If you can do this during not normal duty hours, not our normal training time, like in the evenings and on the weekends, then we'll let you have one crew member out of the crew to do this. And she said, no, we have to have all three trained for this. And I said, well, Tony, it's that or nothing. And so she accepted it, and she got me. Um, wow. Unfortunately, that was all she got, but the others eventually learned some and helped some, but they didn't have to go through the formal training. So we did several hundred hours of training at night and on weekends, and I saw, as I was uh, talking about here, I saw all of the IMAX 3D movies to learn some of the techniques, and. Uh, then we shot some film, some practice film there in Houston in our simulators, and we went and watched my film, and I saw just how good those other people were, and I, I learned through some really harsh, harsh critiques uh, how not to do uh, 3D filming. But eventually I learned a little bit about it. This was my studio. It was a good one. It was a great place to, to work and to film. As you know, the International Space Station is up there for a different reason than making movies. It's, uh, it's built to be a laboratory. Uh, it's an agreement between government, industry, and academia, and an international partnership to do world-class research in space. And that's what it was built for. We just wanted to document some of the things that were going into it to show what it was like from a human perspective to build and live and work on the International Space Station. Uh, the IMAX mission, on the other hand, was a little bit different. Next. You'll have to help me a little bit with this. They wanted to document life on the ISS. They wanted to inspire young people, of course, as they've done with, with uh, many of their works. And, of course, they did want to make some money. 
And in fact, they have. I'll tell you uh, details later on, but they've done very, very, very well. They were in the top 20 for well over a year of all movies. I mean, every movie. It doesn't matter what movie it is with the number of people seeing them and the amount of money they were bringing in uh, in the first couple of years. Well, we had to have a storyline, and what they wanted to do was look at what is it like for people who are going to live and work in space before the flight, the, uh, the things that you have to do to get ready for it, the assembly of the International Space Station, and then what it was really like to live and work up there. And that's hard to describe. When people ask me what it's like to live and work in space, it's a hard thing to talk about. There's so much to it. How do you describe your life here on the Earth every day? You can talk about what you do when you get up in the morning, you drive to work, what you do at work, but there's a lot to it, and it's the same thing. Capturing that and putting it into a, a 30 or 40 minute film is a very difficult task, and I admire the people who came up with our storyline and then who put it together to turn it into a story. We did have a bunch of pre-flight training. Uh, James Niehaus, who was our cinematographer who taught me how to use the camera and how to use it, uh, did a great job of teaching us these other things. The camera operations, how to use the lighting. I really was a lighting technician. It was one of the harder things to get the lighting correct in the movie. Uh, film loading, what a, oh, what a chore that was. You have this great big black bag. And you have to put everything inside there and you have to change it out without looking at it. Well, on the ground, I could do that pretty well. It took me about 12 to 15 minutes. It's uh, the rolls of film are this big around, are 70 millimeter format, so they're very big. The canisters are big. The camera uh, cartridge that you put the film in is, oh, this size, two feet by a foot by a foot and a half. And that all goes into this large plastic bag. You stick your arm in through holes, and then you work without seeing what you're doing. And it's okay on the ground because things stay where you put them. In there, they float around in this great big black bag. You spend all your time searching. Where was that? Uh, where was this piece? So it was a, quite a chore. It took about three times as long on orbit just to load the film uh, that it did on the ground. We also had to be prepared to clean and repair the camera as necessary. I cleaned it periodically. About every time a shuttle flight came up, we did some shooting and they went home, I would break the camera down and clean it. And we had some things go wrong with it we had to fix during that time, and things I had not had time to train for because I didn't get the full training. So I did some exchanging of emails and communicating with uh, Tony and James to find out the things I needed to do, and they sort of taught me through the repair of the camera while we were up there. Uh, we also practiced a lot. We did that, uh, that over and over uh, filming on the ground to learn the mistakes that you make and figure out how to do it. And on the ground we had a big dolly we would put the camera on to move it and slide it around. Uh, in space the 80 pound camera moves around a lot easier than it does on the ground. And then there was that brutal film review that we had too where uh, I don't think until I came back from space did I ever get a kind word from Tony about my filming. <laughs> and then she had to say nice things because the film was done and it wasn't, it wasn't going to be any better. Well this was our taxi to the studio and I'm sure most of you have seen shuttle launches but I had to get this in there. Uh, I couldn't only talk about filming a movie. It's the most exciting thing in the world to ride on a space shuttle. Uh, you know, six and a half seconds after the main engines ignite, the solid rocket boosters ignite, and then we're headed for space. This is what it looks like inside. It's kind of a, a high vibration environment at first until the solid rocket boosters are done. And then when they fall off after about two minutes, it gets to be a very smooth ride. The main engines are as smooth as can be. You're accelerating very quickly. We go from uh, zero to 17,500 miles per hour uh, in about, roughly in about uh, eight and a half minutes. Thereafter, two minutes, the solid rocket boosters fall away. It's like someone hitting the side of a garbage can with a sledgehammer. When that happens, it's this huge boom and you get a bright flash of light over your windows and uh, then it smooths out and it's very nice. You get another uh, few minutes of smooth flight and then all of a sudden your engines slow down, they cut off, and you're floating. You're rising up against your restraints and everything in the cabin starts floating around. You can open up the payload bay doors and look out at the beautiful earth below. Oh, of course, you have to have leading men and women, women for your movie, right? I used to label this my family photo because this was my family in space. Yuri Usachev on the left, he's a Russian engineer. He was our commander for the space station flight, and he's just a wonderful guy. He and I are teaching a class together in Colorado at the University of Colorado this summer, uh, Fundamentals of Human Spaceflight. And I got him to come over this year to help me teach it. And he's going to spend a week there giving the Russian perspective on human spaceflight, including something I thought was really interesting that I'd never talked to him about before. He's going to spend one class on the Russian uh, Mars program. I didn't even know they had a Mars program. 
So that's going to be interesting for me. And on the right-hand side, uh, General Select, Susan Helms. Uh, she just got selected to be promoted to general. She returned to the Air Force uh, not too long after our flight and has done very well there for them and is uh, doing great things for the Air Force like she did for NASA while she was there. Both of them had extensive space flight. Uh, Susan had flown four times also on the space shuttle before we flew together to the space station. Yuri had flown twice on the Mir, two six-month flights on the Mir, and then he flew on a shuttle flight with us when we went up to repair the space station about a year before we, we flew as a, a team for six months. You gotta have some bit actors, you know, all those other guys that are, that are in the movie. <clears throat> this is actually one of the crews that came up to visit us. Uh, it was STS-100. They brought up the Canadian-built robotic arm that we were going to use. Susan and I had put out a cradle on that longest EVA in history. Uh, the arm was brought up and placed in the cradle, and then through the crew of the space shuttle going out EVA and extending the arm out, and then us using the robotic hand controllers inside, we walked it off onto the International Space Station so that it could be used later on for assembly of, mod of different modules. And it was critical to the future assembly of the station to have it work. Well, that crew brought it up, as well as some other things. They brought up a multi-purpose logistics module also that had all of our food, clothing, and goodies that were sent from home. Before they left, they brought out a surprise for us, these Hawaiian shirts. Uh, they said that we needed to have a party before they left, and so we were going to have a luau. Uh, if you notice, there's only one woman in there, Susan, my crewmate, and she was not the one who did this, but for our luau, we did have a hula dancer. And I won't say anything more about that. It wasn't Susan. Well. How did we shoot that 13 miles or 69,000 feet of film in space? We shot it 30 uh, seconds at a time. It's really short. It, all the scenes, if you notice them, if you look at the movie and, and think about it while it's on, all the scenes are very short. It's because you only have 108 seconds of film in the camera. That's three to four scenes at 20 to 30 seconds each. So every scene has to be right and it's got to be able to fit in with everything else. So they did a really nice job of creating the story, telling us what to shoot, and then they let us be creative ourselves and look at some things our, ourselves for shooting when we had more time uh, later on in our flight. This is Sergey Krikalov and uh, Bill Shepard who were on Expedition 1. They had the camera up there and they shot some scenes while the shuttle was up there to uh, take them home. And they, they had it during uh, their mission, uh, the first four months of the space station's life. There, as you can see, if there's not much film in the camera, it, uh, we don't have very much film either. It was very hard to get film on board. We were hauling up critical important things like food, water, air, the things that you really have to have, and Tony was fighting for every roll of film that she got on board. Usually, seven or eight rolls was all it could get on board, and we're thankful she fought so hard for it and got that much up there because it made a wonderful movie in the end. One problem they had was they didn't believe that the film would last if they left it on board because of the radiation environment. As you know, there is a pretty high radiation uh, field in space outside of our atmosphere, and uh, I didn't realize quite how high it was until I got back and I asked them what my radiation exposure was from the, uh, the, the nearly six months on orbit, and they told me that it was not a big deal. So then, well, what was it? And then they told me, well, uh, it's this many rads. I said, well, what does that mean? And, or rim, I guess. And, the, and I said, what does that really mean? They said, well, it's the equivalent of 400 chest x-rays. Then it made me understand why they were worried about their film on orbit. I was more worried about me at that point. But they told me, don't worry about it. Uh, the, uh, they didn't leave film on orbit. They carried it up on the shuttle, and they brought it back. So you had oh, six to 10 days to do all of your filming, and you've got a thousand other things. When a shuttle is at the space station, every minute of every day is scheduled. You have so many things to do, transferring cargo over, doing uh, certain experiments, reboosting. There's so many things to do. The crew stays on the fly versus run all day long. And it was very, very difficult to take time out and set up and shoot an IMAX scene. To set it up, you spend about 30 to 45 minutes running all the wires for the lights. They can't stay up because we have to budget when we can use certain power for certain things. So we would string up our lights, set them up where we wanted them. Once we got it set up, we'd get the camera ready to go, 
we would have to make people stop working and come and rehearse a little bit if, uh, if we were going to try to do a good scene. And then we would have to shoot it. It usually took several hours of a crew member's time to get it all ready to go. So very difficult to do. And it was because we, we had to do it during the shuttle docked operation times. Well, accidentally, a roll of film got left on orbit. Uh, it didn't get shot, so I, I said, well, let's just leave it up here, and maybe we can shoot it and use it. And we put it in a, a radiation uh, protective locker. Uh, we made that by surrounding it with water. We had big water bags that we used on orbit. We put the water bags around it, and then we had some radiation protective tiles that's made out of a, a polyethylene material that had been sent up to provide protection for Susan and her sleep station, which was uh, built by us. So we used this material as well to protect the film, and sure enough, it worked. So after that, they began leaving film on board for us to shoot during the more leisurely time between shuttle flights, and that worked out really well. There's some just numbers about it, how big it is. Uh, it's a great big old thing. It's heavy, it's awkward to use. Pretty easy to use in space though. Uh, it still has mass, so when you start moving in, you've got to be prepared to stop yourself or you'll run right into your subjects. Uh, it is pretty big film and it takes two simultaneous pictures. That's how they do the 3D with this. Uh, they're able to do it with different methods now and they actually expanded some of our, our scenes with special techniques, but generally it's, it takes two shots at the same time, just like using your eyes so you get that stereo effect and you can see the 3D when you project it in a movie. That's a shot of one of the shuttle crews, uh, Pam Melroy and uh, Brian Duffy who uh, were shooting a flight on a visiting crew before there were humans on board. And a lot of the really spectacular scenes that you see in the movie of the, uh, the crews working outside and assembling the space station were done by shuttle crews who visited before we had resident crews on board. Well, there were a few things we didn't film. The, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but you know, there was an alien scene in the movie. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that one later on, but this was the what the alien did in his spare time when he wasn't acting. Hard to get him to do much work after he got that bit part in the movie. <laughs> and this, this is a, an actual photograph <laughs> of Charlie Hobaugh who came up on a shuttle flight and he was a rookie, it was his first flight, and he was having a little difficulty and I, I'm embarrassing to show this I guess, but uh, I took the picture because he was so proud of himself when he finally had success. <laughs> Uh, here's some things that we did film, the life and working on the space station. Uh, now this is where you're going to have to use your imagination. I had a little glitch. The, the DVD for the IMAX 3D space station movie is coming out in July. We were supposed to have gotten a preview copy that we were going to use to insert, and I was going to show you some of the really neat scenes that we filmed during the movie that I had something to do with. And I was going to tell you a little background on those movies, some of the stuff behind it. Uh, an insider story, the stuff that will probably be somewhat, some of it will be on the DVD and those extra things you get at the end. Uh, well, we didn't get the DVD movie, so sorry. <laughs> if you've seen the movie, remember. If you haven't, use your imagination. And I'll try to describe it. The Onions was a scene. We had an onion that came up. The Russians send up uh, care packages in their progress resupply vehicles. When you open the hatch on the progress, there's this wonderful smell that comes out of it of fruit and vegetables that have been stored for a while. I don't know if it's a pleasant smell on the earth or not, but after the sterile environment of space station, when all you have to smell are your crewmates, it's a really pleasant smell. They didn't smell. We, we maintain good personal hygiene while we were up there. But you open that hatch and it's a wonderful smell. Well, normally it's things like apples, oranges, lemons. Uh, there, and, and then they had some onions, and I thought that was a little peculiar, why they would include onions with this. But uh, they sat there, they were in a, a little container that had a mesh side on it, and we would periodically eat one of those vegetables or a piece of the fruit. And it was very pleasant having that. Well, after a while, there was nothing left but the onions. And so one day, Yuri got one of the onions out of there, and he took a big bite out of it. And he said, Jim, try this, it's really good. <laughs> well, I, I've done a lot of things in my time living in, in Russia training uh, that were, I thought I needed to do because of cultural reasons. And eating an onion wasn't going to be one of them, I didn't think. But I, I did try it, and sure enough, it tasted really good. Uh, it must have been a variety, something like a Vidalia onion. It was sweet tasting, and it was really good. We fought over the rest of it. It was, it was an ex <laughs> excellent snack. 
another, we had another onion left that was not eaten and we didn't eat it on purpose because it had been a couple of weeks while we ate the other fruit uh, and the onion just sat there. It started to sprout. And well, that was a pretty wonderful thing. We don't see many growing things on the space station. So Yuri got this onion. He said, we're not gonna eat this one. He put it in a plastic bag with a washcloth wrapped around it and moistened the, the washcloth. And we watched the onion grow over the next few weeks. And of course it consumed itself. There was no dirt or other nutrients for it. So it just consumed itself, but the, the uh, green sprouts on it grew to about a foot and a half long. And we had a plant growing on the space station. And it was a self-starter. It was wonderful having it there. Well, I made the mistake of telling Tony about this onion. I was thinking, well, that might, something colorful is better than all the you know, drab kind of colors that we typically have. And she got really excited about it. And, and, but in this exchange of emails, which took a, a, a week or so, the onion finished using its own nutrients and it started to wilt and it was, it, it was worthless for a prop. By the time Tony sent me back a note and said, you've got to shoot that, that's gonna be a great thing to do. And then I thought, oh gosh, we don't have it any longer. So now I'm gonna have to disappoint her. So I sent her a note back. The next shuttle flight that came up had a bag of green onions. <laughs> I don't know how she does it. I, I guess I should know because she, she got me to, to do all this extra training. But, uh, she got a bag of green onions on board and they came up and we shot the onion scene with those green onions. I was watering them uh, to, to show that we could grow plants and that uh, things like that happen naturally in space. The uh, bolt scattering surprise thing was something that sort of happened accidentally. They intended to open this bag and this bag of, of bolts and nuts that come out of the progress when you, uh, when you disassemble and take everything out. And they intended for them to come slowly floating out and be very elegant. Well, Susan opened this bag, and if you recall in the movie, things go everywhere, and they just go. Everywhere. And she has this wonderful look of surprise on her face that was genuine, and there was no acting going on. She was truly surprised by it. And Tony says it's her favorite scene in the whole movie. So next time, or when you watch the movie, uh, look for that scene and know that it was uh, completely a surprise to everybody that the things went everywhere. The uh, sleeping, sleeping Susan. Hardest thing I did with shooting this movie was shooting a movie in the dark. And it wasn't completely dark, but it was pretty dark. And they wanted us to shoot something like that. I'd seen a scene, and we talked about it before this in one of the early shuttle movies. I'd seen a, a scene of astronauts sleeping. And I thought, well, this would be kind of a nice thing to do to come flying into the module and go up and look at one of the crew while they're sleeping. And I talked to James about it. He said, yeah, great idea to do that. So I got up there, and then I said, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what we need the settings for dark. I know when we get all this extra light, and we have to have a lot of light for the IMAX. So we started a three or four week exchange of emails back and forth about how to do this. And he told me technically how to do it. And I kept worrying and thinking, well, I don't know. I, I, you can't really see well enough to set the f-stop on the camera correctly. So what do I do? Finally, he sent me an email note. And he said, Jim, just shoot the damn thing. <laughs> And so I did, and it turned out to be a very, very nice scene. Uh, if you see it, you'll, I think you'll appreciate that. It had some really nice music. In fact, it was the music I selected. I forgot to put that. What do you call a person that does the music for a movie? I've got to add that. Uh, yeah, the mixing, you know, I didn't do it, but I selected the music anyway. It's up on the roof uh, by the drifters, and they fit it in. They, they asked us what our favorite music was and picked some things, and then they fit it into the movie. And then the aliens, you may have seen that. It was, I had 10 seconds left on a roll of film. I used up all the rest and 10 seconds is worthless. They told me, don't even bother usually with 10 seconds of film. They need 20 seconds minimum, 30 is a, a much better length and 40 is getting a little bit too long for them. So I had this little bit left over and I said, well, I hate to waste it. And on the wall was this little Gumby alien that Susan had that she'd carried on some of her space flights before. And a friend of mine had sent up the, a little blow-up alien doll that was on the wall. So I said, well, shoot, I'll just shoot the aliens. Pulled them off, stuck them up in the air, let them float there. I shot them and went, whirr, stop. It was just nothing. It was no time at all. Well, I, I got back on the ground. Much to my surprise, here they had 20 or 30 seconds worth of aliens floating in the movie. And I said, how in the world did they get that? And Tony said she liked it so much, having something that people could relate to would be a little funny thing to stick into the movie, that they extended it. I guess they made extra prints of it. And so it's showing the same thing sort of in a loop there. Uh, but it was how that got into the movie in the first place. Uh, we tried to shoot what life was like. Living there, we shot scenes of us in our sleep stations like this. That was my bedroom. It's a little smaller than a phone booth, if you are old enough to remember what phone booths are like. 
but you got to personalize it. Behind me is my sleeping bag. Uh, very comfortable sleeping upright like that. I was telling uh, someone over lunch that sleeping is one of the things I like best about space. It's wonderful to sleep in space. There are no pressure points. I slept soundly from the minute I closed my eyes to the minute our alarm went off and I woke up feeling like a teenager. Remember how it was when you were young and you woke up and you hop out of bed and feel good and just go do, off to do things right away? Well, I don't remember being like that so much recently, uh, but it was that way in space. It was just wonderful. Uh, and on the wall, you can see some of my personal things that I put there to make it my space, to make me remember Earth and uh, the things that I would be missing there. I had pictures of plants, flowers, my house, my dog, my family, uh, other things that would uh, remind me of home. And I changed those, rotated them every week. And I'm thankful Yuri had flown a lot before because he advised me to bring lots of pictures. He said, don't worry about other stuff. Bring pictures from home and put those up in your Cayuta, the sleep station. And that was a great suggestion. Uh, this was our dinner table. We did some filming around the dinner table. You may recall the one in the movie, or if you get to see it, you'll see. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people around the table, a visiting shuttle crew. And everybody's there but me. Uh, I didn't get invited because I was doing the camera work. And they were having a great time throwing tortillas around and M&Ms and playing with their food like astronauts do. And uh, you may recall, or if you don't, you'll see the, there is a point where someone tosses an orange at the camera. And when we were practicing this, I made them practice a couple of times before we shot it, and they were having a good time. And by the time we did it, they were having too good a time, I think. And you may notice a lot of the smiles, and they were having some fun. And so as we're doing this, if you could hear what was in the background, I was saying, okay, cue the tortilla, okay, the M&Ms. And, and then I'd say, and now the orange, but don't hit the camera. Here it comes, right into the lens, boom. <laughs> but it turned out to be a really good thing, even though we didn't want it to be that way. Uh, we did a lot of science on board too. I, I have science at the end of this thing, but I'm not going to show it to you today. We, we did do science during our expedition. We didn't film a lot of it because it's pretty boring stuff looking at the front of racks. Uh, couldn't even see the plants we were growing in the plant growing experiment. They were inside, but they had to, to send up pictures of it to us so we could see what was happening. But there is, uh, there is some science that's going on, and I can only hope that it will continue to improve and become even better science over uh, the years as we operate the space station. Uh, we did work with systems too. We install systems on the inside. Uh, we have a little bit of that in the movie and on the outside as well. Uh, that was a vacuum hose that we used for vacuuming out experiments and our uh, major constituents analyzer. We did uh, film things outside like this, the moving of the airlock. It was brought up on uh, mission 7A to the space station and it was the first time the robotic arm from Canada was used on the space station to move a large object like this, about 20,000 pounds. It moved it from the payload bay of the space shuttle over and made it to the space station. And it worked very, very well. We had uh, three crews come up to visit us. We tried to film some of them arriving and leaving. We get scenes like this of the shuttle looking down with the Earth behind it. It's just beautiful looking at the Earth. And I'll show you a couple of Earth pictures in just a minute. We always liked having visitors come. We also like working outside. This was uh, doing a spacewalk. Uh, we did some, uh, there's a lot of footage of, of uh, EVAs that was taken with a different camera, not the one we used inside. We did a little bit from the inside, some of the close-up views, like the, the guys coming up and, uh, and uh, being right there in the hatch. That was done from the inside. But a lot was done from another larger camera out in the payload bay of the space shuttle that was uh, shot automatically from inside. It's beautiful working outside. Uh, doing spacewalks, that's something I could talk about for hours and maybe a topic, another topic one day. We also filmed the arrival of the Soyuz when it came up to visit us. I got in trouble for this one. I'm not sure why I got in trouble for it, because they told us to film the Soyuz arrival and out of the lab window, so I filmed it out of the lab window. And uh, then after I finished filming it, they said, why did you leave the lab cover off uh, or why did you leave the lab window uncovered while the Soyuz arrived? It will get plumed by the, the jets from the Soyuz. And I, I didn't know how to answer them, <laughs> except that you told me to film it. <laughs> so we did. And we got great footage of it. <laughs> did I mention that it's really neat to go outside? <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking out the window is another one of those things that are just great about being in space. The view from space is wonderful. 
it's even better when you're outside uh, doing a spacewalk. You can see more. It's like the difference in looking out the window here or going outside. Uh, you really can see a lot more, but both can be very spectacular. It was one of our recreational activities. You know where this is? We'll take a look at some of the things we could see and that we filmed, these type of things. Well, you've got to know it's somewhere in the southwest, right? Down near Lake Powell. Uh, that's Mount Etna. It was erupting at the time we were up there, and they asked us to take a lot of pictures every time we flew over it. Uh, it's a lot easier than getting somebody to go fly over an active volcano in an airplane. <laughs> that's an impact crater in Canada. It uh, made me think of a couple of things. One, I got to watch the seasons change from winter like this through summer, and it made me think about the the dangers that we face here on the Earth with uh, things that can do this kind of uh, damage to our Earth's surface uh, could put us all at risk. I don't know if you heard Rusty Swiker's talk the other day. Uh, he talked about those kind of things, and it makes you think about it when you can see it on this scale from space. We looked at the Pacific Ocean a lot. It's big. <laughs> you spend a lot of time out there, and you're really happy when you see an atoll or an island so you can uh, have something else to look at other than vast expanses of the ocean or the clouds. I'm sure you'll recognize this. It's been photographed by everybody. It's so striking when you see the deserts like the Sahara here, and that's, of course, the Nile River Delta and the Nile going down off to the side. Let's see, there it is. There's the Nile River. And that's the Mediterranean, and of course, uh, the solar array there you can see because this is a view out my bedroom window. The Betsy Boca River Valley uh, coming out into the, the ocean, uh, Madagascar. And we look back at this because it's where we came from. That's the launch site of the Kennedy Space Center. You can see the, the two pads there, pad A and pad B, vehicle assembly building. Here's the shuttle landing facility right there that we returned to after our five and a half months. <coughs> you might know where that is. There's a little help. There's the Capitol. There's the White House. Well, there's the Pentagon. And there's where we are. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for that question. We did get to see a lot of these, too, sunrises and sunsets. Of course, we get one or the other every 45 minutes, and they're just spectacular. Uh, you know, that's a pretty picture, but it's nothing like the real thing. It's, it's like a photograph that you take when you're at the Grand Canyon, and you see all these beautiful colors of the sun rising, and then you go home and look at it and say, oh, it looked a lot better than this. Same thing there. When the sun rises, there's a glow on the horizon. It's a light blue, and then you get a deeper blue near the edge of the earth and a lighter blue above. And then the colors just start erupting in bands over the horizon, uh, purple, orange, red, yellow. And then it explodes when the sun comes up. It happens so fast. It's not like a slow sunrise on the earth where it comes up a little bit at a time. These colors, they just happen very quickly, and then, boom, it explodes. You can't look at it anymore. It's just really beautiful. Well, it was a great place and a great place to capture on film, and I sure did enjoy uh, working on the International Space Station IMAX program. Uh, Post-flight, we had to do a few things, too. We did some interviews. A lot of that shows up in the DVD that they made. Uh, the editing was done by Tony, and they did a wonderful job of putting it together. I don't know how they took all those miles of film, turned it into a story that makes sense, and it, it tells what it was like to prepare for and to actually fly and do some of the things that were done with the assembly of the International Space Station. And then we had that voiceover thing that uh, Tom Cruise did. Uh, I had a picture of him in here, but it had his kids in it. I figured he may not want that, so I, I took it out. Oh, wait, I didn't take it out. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> well, you can't see his kids' faces. Quick, go on to the next one. <laughs> I'll let you read the credits. <laughs> This is what really happened. It was an extremely successful movie. Fourteen and a half million people have seen it. That's a lot. 1.2 at our own uh, National Air and Space Museum, and over $85 million so far is what it's grossed. And on July 19th, we can all own our own copy of it and look at it at home. And I hope you uh, uh, can appreciate from my quick discussion about the work how hard it was, not just for me, but for all the people involved with making this movie. It's a spectacular movie. It tells the story of our nation's space program and how it is built 
uh, with international partner assistance, a wonderful facility and space for us to live and work on. And I hope it's just a precursor to what will happen in the future with all of us and the ability of all of us to go to space and enjoy the same kind of things that we enjoy by watching that movie right now. Uh, we're going to be able to answer some questions in a, in a few minutes. Right. Oh, good. I, I would have forgotten anyway by the time we got around to it. So it's, we're going to take three questions right now if you have them, and then we will have our second speaker. Yes, sir. Real loud, please. Yes, sir. Um, I'm hoping I'm not confusing you with another uh, one of your fellow astronauts, but uh, didn't you and your daughter have a certain father-daughter relationship as far as the designing of the uh, spacesuit gloves that you tested out? And also, did you not uh, get a special uh, certificate of achievement from the American Society of Cinematographers? Uh, the question was, did my did I and my daughter have something to do with the testing of gloves? And, and, was, and he thought he might be mistaking me with someone else. Well, I'm not Janice Voss, uh, who's another astronaut, and we're no relation, and she's not my daughter. Uh, and no, I, I didn't have anything to do with the design. I've tested a lot of spacesuit gloves, but uh, not anything to do with my daughter. Uh, and the other thing was the certificate. No, I got a special certificate from the environmental control guys in the Mission Control Center because I helped them fix so much stuff. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. I would say it take, took about two hours uh, to really set up the movie. And usually that was a couple of people doing it. The lighting was very difficult to set up. Wires are a pain in space. They want to go everywhere. You have to tie them down. And we and there are not a lot of plugs on the space station. We have a bunch, but there's so much electrical equipment plugged into them that we don't have a lot of free electrical outlets. So we have to move things around. Uh, we have to plug in and then run wires from one module to another, then set up the lights, check the lighting, uh, set up the camera, get the f-stop thing set up, do some cleanup and getting the, the scene set up for it, and then dragging people over. Stop doing real work over here and come over here and, and practice your the scene. And uh, that took some time. And then the actual shooting was maybe 30 to 45 seconds once you got there, but it took a lot of preparation, like any movie. Lots of time to, to shoot the scenes. I mean, just one more. Yes, sir. Um, Bill Gardner, uh, your culinary feats in orbit reminded me of a proposal um, a company made in the mid-80s in a study relationship between uh, protein consumption of calcium bars. And it wasn't funded, but they applied that experiment on STS-107. Fortunately, they didn't get a sample of that. So I wonder what you might know about that and if that's going to be flown again. Yeah, well, what do I know about the experiment to, to uh, look at our bone mass loss and what was the particular well it was uh, correlating protein intake protein intake with, with bone mass, mass loss i don't know i would expect that it will be one of the experiments that we fly again because we're very concerned about bone mass loss in long duration space flight uh, i lost about an average of five percent of my bone mass in my five and a half months up there you lose one to one and a half percent of your bone mass per month the sensor in your body that tells you you need to produce bone mass, quits telling you to produce bone mass when you're in space because your bones aren't loaded. So it doesn't sense the need to keep building bone mass. And we're continually losing bone mass just through normal processes. So you lose it all the time. We're concerned about it. We have tried, we've done some experiments. We do some things with loading our bones, uh, like the exercise we do, uh, sort of weight lifting with resisted exercise devices, running on a treadmill. Those are thought to be good things to do. During the MIR program, uh, they had results of from 5 to 20% bone mass loss. And 20% is pretty darn serious. And it comes back very, very slowly. Uh, mine is just now come back to what they think is normal after uh, flying in 2001. So it's a serious problem. And we need to continue doing research. And part of the President's exploration program is to use the International Space Station to help us to learn the things that we need to know to go on to explore, to go back to the moon, and to go on to Mars. And part of that is understanding the effect on human beings of long-term stays in space and making our systems work better and things like that. So bone mass loss studies will continue to be, it has to be part of our, our program. That and radiation are the two areas that I think are and probably uh, muscle atrophy for immediate work when you get on the surface of Mars are the three things that we have to worry a lot about before we go there. Well, again, thank you very much. I'll be glad to talk to you some more. I'll be around all afternoon if you have other questions.
behalf of the National Space Society, I want to thank you for being here. Great talk, entertaining, and accept this memento on behalf of us. Thank you, thank you very much.